Um, there we go. Aha. That'll wake you up. Okay, bring me down just about two notches. It's good to see you. We're glad to be out of the snow. I told Mary as it was coming down, I said, we're going to have a Missouri winter this year. Because this is something that we're used to. One of our kids typed us and said, is this the kind of snow you all dealt with? I said, yeah, and we also went to school uphill and back home uphill. You know, same way. But yes, we, that, that we were used to these kind of snows. But uh, it does... Iced up roads, when you're on mountains, it just makes it a little difficult. So uh, uh, we're just thankful that everybody is safe. Nobody has been injured. You know, God has blessed us. Nobody's been injured. Uh, everybody's been able to get home and, and uh, stay safe. And uh, some of us have had to go to work and still got home and stayed safe. Uh, even with our side roads, just about nothing but ice. I know ours was down River Road. It was nothing but ice. And uh, when we got to 247, it was cleared. But, boy, I mean, just packed ice all the way up. But it's, yes, ma'am. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. It made COVID. Maybe it's because we couldn't get out and get around to Walmart, you know. <laughs> that might be the case. But anyway, you have the 14th bulletin, all right? And that's because we couldn't even get down here to the church. Sheila couldn't even get down to church this week. Uh, it, she was packed out. <laughs> I think there was three cars in the ditch up there by you too, wasn't there? I think it was. So uh, we'll get back on online this week and get things going. Uh, are you still having a financial piece tonight? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. We will not have church tonight. We will next Sunday. We'll have our business meeting. Uh, we got rain coming in. We're not sure if it's going to freeze over. Probably won't freeze over until late tonight. But we've got rain that is moving in. Uh, but uh, that'll help get rid of a lot of snow, too. So we should see a, a, a big change in the weather here. And believe it or not, Tuesday it's going to be 60. Crazy weather. It's Arkansas. So keep in mind the things that are coming up. Uh, the housewarming for Heather, we're going to be getting another date on that. They canceled that uh, because of the weather. Uh, we still will be doing our... Um, uh, I think we've done all of our food boxes. Is that correct? Or we got one more? We got this, this uh, the church's one coming up, don't we? Uh, the food box on Tuesday? Yes, on Tuesday. And it should be clear for everybody to come. So uh, any, any announcements that need to be made that we weren't able to get into the bulletin? All right, all right, we sure will. And I, uh, adults, if we get a large enough group of adults that we can't meet someplace, it's a good place to meet, man. We've got it already set up. You've got a TV down there. Yeah, I thought probably <laughs> joint groups already thought about that. It's going to be a good place to meet. All right. All right, if there's no other announcements, we're ready to get started. Okay, Jacob, come on. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord. Please stand and let's begin worship this morning with How Majestic Is Your Name. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name.
Continue worship with trust and obey. Good morning. Well, if you didn't know it, it's winter time outside. Um, and boy, that stinks, doesn't it, Skylar? You can't even get a snow day off from school anymore, can you? With the virtual teaching now. But uh, hopefully this will bring you some peace. There are some scripture in the Bible that talks about snow. And that's what I want to share with you this morning. Isaiah 55, verse 10 through uh, 10 and 11 says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that comes out of my mouth. It will not return return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Amen. Brother Howard, could I ask you to lead us in prayer? Dear Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have of being here today. We thank you, Lord, for all the weather you brought us because you had a reason for it. But we do thank you, Lord, now that things are clearing away and we can sign to see some signs of spring coming. We know, Lord, that you're in control of all things, so help us to trust you in everything that goes on, knowing that you've got it. You've got a control of it, and all we need to do is just to, to follow you in everything. Bless this time of worship as we come together to give you worship in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Let's stand once again and let's continue worship within his time. Let's conclude worship this morning with We Fall Down. A couple of things I want to mention before we get started this morning. First of all, I want to thank uh, Cody and Jonathan and all of the Building and Grounds Committee who have been in and out here all through this time of weather, making sure that the pipes don't freeze, that the water was running, everything was going. They made sure that we got the uh, uh, parking lot cleaned. I want to thank you all for that. Thank W. Taylor for that too, Gene. Tell him we said thank you very much, all right, for getting our parking lot clean where we can get in. And uh, we have a good, good group of workers around here that keep things going. And I want you all to know that they're doing their job. Two committees have met. One is getting ready to meet this week, and that's our youth and uh, song leader committee. We'll be meeting this week, uh, kind of looking over some things. I want you all to pray about that. As a matter of fact, we're wanting to do a series of time of prayer for this because, you know, God's got somebody for us. And he'll bring us to it, but I think we need to pray about it. We need to really pray what God wants here for the church, uh, for a youth director, for a music director, or a combination, whichever. 
Uh, but keep that in mind because I think that that's really significant for our worship and need. Not that, that Jacob's not doing a good job, but, you know, he may want to lay this down sometime before long. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to let you know that we have got folks that I really can depend on here and I really thank them and uh, Sheila I think we can make it back to work tomorrow okay <laughs> she'd call me every morning and or I'd call her and say look I don't even try to get in there because uh, I didn't want her sliding off she's got one of those nice little cars but that thing can get in the spin real quick so Kim good to see you here this morning how's things up in Omaha that's her figure, yeah. <laughs> I lived up in that area around Yellville for several years, and so I know what it gets like out there when it gets the snow. It gets kind of crazy up there. If you've got your Bibles, you might want to turn to Job, the 19th chapter. I'm going to include verses 25 through 27 in this. Job 19, 25 through 27. And uh, this passage deals with some of the things maybe we've been dealing with. Triumph in trouble. Triumph in trouble. How do we overcome issues in our, in our life and, and uh, where do we see victory in? Job was having a real tough time. I don't know if you all have read through the book of Job. I've read through there and I really wonder if those two friends that were with him or three friends that were with him were really his friends. Some of the things that, uh, that he said, uh, that they said to him uh, and his wife even messed up. Told him, hey, why don't you curse God and die, you know? And uh, he surely would have if he would cursed God, you know, because you don't curse God and live through that. Uh, that's part of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So um, look at, verse, at these verses, if you would. Go ahead and put them up on screen, if you will. I've got mine just for reference here. Uh, Job 19. Did you ever have a Bible that stuck its pages? Job 19. Yeah, 25 through 27 says, for I know that my Redeemer lives. I'm going to stop right there. When we sing hymns, you need to know that those hymns were written from Scripture. They teach doctrine. They teach what we believe. A lot of people don't realize that. I know that a lot of churches have gone away from the hymnal book and not using the hymns anymore. But I'm glad we do a blended service in our music because hymns do teach us Scripture. And when I read this very first one, For I know that my Redeemer lives. How many remember that song? Yeah, that Jesus is our Redeemer. I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, even before Jesus came upon the scene, Job knew he would be here. Job knew that you had provided a means by which sin would be forgiven. For he speaks of a Redeemer. He was facing in his life, the greatest trials that he had ever faced. He was seeing the mercy of God, even in all of that. Father, help us grasp that concept. To know that you are a God that walks with us during our times of troubles. Give us strength now, Lord, as we hear your word. Let it become a guide for us this week. This we ask in the name of Jesus, for he is worthy. Amen. Now, all of you remember the story. Job is remembered by having, or by the many during times of trouble. If you remember what he went through. Everything was going great. It was like he was blessed above all men of God. He had children. He had family. He had cattle. He had goats. He had horses. He had all the things of the earth at that point in time that were, were precious and needed. He was wealthy. He had more than one house. And in one day, if you remember the story, in one day it was all gone. Boom. It's hard to catch an understanding of that. Now some of you all who have been through a fire understand that. 
1961, our house burned to the ground. I was in junior high. And when that happened, we lost everything. Only what my dad could get out of the house. And believe it or not, he actually threw a couch through a window to get it out of the house. I, evidently, adrenaline can really give you strength. He got a few clothes out. But we lost everything out of that house. All of the meat that we had started in a, the deep freeze where we had uh, just put a, uh, a whole hog in there and it just got the heat deep freeze so hot in keeping it cooled it down. And it was in February. That's why I remember it in February. So it's kind of rough weather. But it was in February. There was two inches of snow on the ground. It had fallen overnight and froze. And all I could do was grab my bathrobe and my pajamas and as I was going out of the house, a methylate bottle busted over the top of my head because the fire was right there behind my room. You remember things like that. And from that point on, we had to rebuild from nothing. Oh yeah, there was insurance on it, but not a whole lot. We did buy a house across the street from that and we saw the charred remains of that house, which was the original Withers Mill. The little community was called Withers Mill because the house we lived in was a mill that actually had a wheel. The wheel had been taken down. When we remodeled it, when we pulled out the floor joists and things, the floor joists were timbers that they had used and put the floor on top of. It burned completely to the ground. In just a little while, Everything we had was gone. Job's troubles. Many people realize that sometimes in their life. You'll have a loss of a job, a, a, a loss of a family member, uh, someone who is close to you. That becomes serious when you lose somebody like that. Well, Job had his troubles. His troubles were greater than most. But Job had three questions of God. If you look at chapter 14, verses 4 through 14, there, there are several of them there. That I'm going to just read you 4 and 10 and 14. If I can get over to them. He had three questions of God. Number one, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing? In Job 14, 4, it says, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing? No one. In Job 14, 10, the second question, if a man give up the ghost, where is he? Where does he go? Verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 10 says, but man dies and is laid away. Indeed, he breathes his last, and where is he? These are all questions that Job asked. In chapter 14, verse 14, he said, if a man shall live again, if a man dies, shall he live again? And he says, for if a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service I will wait Till my change comes. And then later on in chapter 19, he says, I know my Redeemer lives. Somewhere between chapter 14 and chapter 18, Job got hope. His faith was rekindled. Was it from his friends? I don't think so. His friends didn't seem to give him any kind of encouragement whatsoever. Their constant thing was, man, what was the sin you committed that God's caught you in this kind of condition? Because you see, back in that day, if a man was down and out, the first thing that came on the mind of people around him, what kind of sin did he do? If you were rich and prosperous and everything going good, then they said, ah, he's found God's favor, He's done exactly what he needed to do. Sometimes that doesn't happen, folks. Sometimes that's not the case. You could do everything right and still have troubles. All of us do. So how do we deal with that? Well, Job had a friend. And he was able to he help defeat 
depression. He had confidence in a living Redeemer even though Jesus had not yet been born. Why do you think that? By the way, we believe that Job is probably the oldest book in the Old Testament. So that means before even Moses collected Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the book of Job was there. The writings of Job was there. So how did he know? I believe God told him. I believe that God gave him impressions in his heart and mind that he was going to take care of things like never before. Job's friends was Jesus. It wasn't the others that he had around him. Oh, they tried to help. And if you look uh, and read some of the things that uh, they tried to give him suggestions on, you'll think, my word, what kind of friends are these? If I had friends like this, I wouldn't need enemies. Because each and every one of them were trying to give him some kind of suggestion that he did something wrong. Now, somebody said, well, why did this happen to Job? The only occurrence that I can see that some, some theologians have said is perhaps it was the pride that he had in the life that he lived that might have been because of what happened to him. But if you remember correctly and go back and read the beginning of it, where did it all start? Satan. The Bible says that Satan was walking to and fro upon the earth. And he came before God and, and he said, have you considered or God asked him and says, you considered my servant Job? And Satan, yeah, you pretty good God, take away all he's got and he'll curse you. So he said, go ahead. Nothing happens to us unless God permits it. Or you permit it. You can create your own problems, as I said in the front sermon not far out back. You can create your own problems. But Satan likes to strike at those that belong to the Lord. He doesn't need to strike at his kids. He's already got them sent to hell. He strikes at the Christian. And he accuses us before the Lord. That's why as Christians when he goes before the Lord and starts pointing his finger down at us and what we're doing Jesus says, back off, buddy. They're mine. And it's under my blood. You see, that's the biggest irritation that Satan has, is that he cannot accuse us and get away with it. Poor Job didn't know about Jesus, but I'm sure that if he had have known, he'd have already been a Christian. Because he describes in Leviticus 25 through 55 the, the work of the Redeemer. If you want to go look at that, you can do that. That's a long passage. But it talks about the relative in dire need. The Redeemer comes and frees him. That's called the Goel. Did you know that? And that's what we see that it's represented in the book of Ruth. Boaz was the Goel. In the Hebrew, or in the Hebrew word, it means a kinsman redeemer somebody who was my kinsman redeemed me and that's what happened in the book of Ruth if you'll read that love story Boaz was the kinsman redeemer the Goel Christ is our kinsman redeemer how do we know he's a kinsman because he came here upon the earth and became as we are And he taught his apostles and his disciples that we are kin. If you believe in me, you are my disciple. Not only are you my disciple, but you are my friend. He said, I die for my friends. There's a relationship with the Redeemer. But we have to understand that rescue also brings responsibility. In Deuteronomy 7, 8, it says that 
We need to love and obey him. I think I've looked those up. I, I was sneaky on these. I went down and looked them up and put them back here in the back where I could get to them real quick. No, I didn't get Deuteronomy. I got Romans. Deuteronomy tells us that, he, that we are to love and obey him. In the 15th chapter of Deuteronomy, it says, show his love and care to others. In the 24th chapter of Deuteronomy, it says, show compassion and have mercy. Redemption calls for responsibility. What we receive from Christ, we are to share with the world. The same we are treated, we are to treat others. That's the responsibility that comes with redemption. I love the term of redemption because it literally means that I have been redeemed from all my sins. And I love the term justified because it means that just as if I had not done it. Christ became our redeemer. And Job looked to him for that. Redemption is the reason also for praise. That's why we come together. That's why we gather here at this church and we sing his praises and we talk about what he has done and we share our testimonies and we give God praise because of our redemption. Some of the books that I'm reading talk about what's going to happen during the tribulation period. I think I got a real sense this week the fact that the tribulation period is God's last chance for mankind to come into the kingdom. I looked at that, what is Revelations said from the chapter 7 on of the different judgments that are going to take place. And I can't imagine going through those things. That's why I believe that we're not going to be there because we're not, according to the scripture, we're not children of wrath. We are children of God's love. And I believe that we will be taken out in the, tri- in the rapture before this all takes place. It also says in the Bible that there's going to be a great revival. But you know it doesn't say whether it's before or after the tribulation. Or during the tribulation. Now there's great revival going on around the world. We're not seeing a whole lot of it in America right now. But you know we're not the only part of the kingdom of God. But there's going to be a tremendous revival that takes place in the tribulation. They're going to have 144,000 Jewish saints preaching the gospel. They're going to have two witnesses. Elijah and I believe Enoch. Others believe Moses. That's fine. We don't have to quarrel over that matter. Whoever God sends back, they've got a job to do. And they're going to be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're going to preach it so hard that for three and a half years, there's not going to be any rain. They're going to hold back the rain. They're going to cause all kinds of calamity to come on. Giving man one more chance to recognize who God is. And that he is a redeemer God. You know how I know there's going to be millions? One of the passages of Revelation says that there were the martyrs, the saints, underneath the throne of God, crying out, saying, when will you avenge us? Martyrs, my friends, are folks that have given up their life for their belief in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that they are millions, a multitude that is uncountable, that come out of tribulation. Not just the ordinary things we go through here. This is not tribulation, folks. Great tribulation is going to be that seven years after the rapture that takes place. So I believe there's going to be a great revival in the tribulation period. And we're going to meet those tribulation saints. And they're going to have a whole different kind of duty to do than what we are going to do. When we come back, church, you know what you're going to be doing? You're going to be administering and helping God or Christ minister to the world that has been renewed after all of the tribulation period. Not the new heaven and earth, that's different. I believe that he's going to heal this earth of all the disasters 
that have taken place in the tribulation period, and he's going to set up his throne in Jerusalem, and we, the Bible says, the saints are going to come back and be judges and rulers with him. Do you think you were just going to lay around on a cloud and play a harp? We've got jobs for us, folks. We're going to help administer in a new and different world for a thousand years under the reign of Christ. Then he's going to clear it all off at the very end after Satan's left loose for a little while and people who hadn't heard of the gospel or who had been born during that thousand years that have not accepted Jesus, they're going to rebel and go with him and then they're finally going to put it to an end. In the new heaven and the new earth. Is it possible that Job understood all of this? I think Job was one of those just like Enoch. That he walked with God. And that he trusted God all the way through these troubles. To redeem him from them. The term redemption means being placed back into that favored position that you were in before you lost it. That's what's happened to us. When you trust in Jesus Christ, you have been redeemed. You've been placed back into the Shekinah glory of God that Adam and Eve walked in during the time of the Garden of Eden. We are His glory. We are in His glory. We are a part of his glory because we've been put back into the right position which we lost. The work of redemption is a powerful thing. Job's faith had confidence in God. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Now, he wasn't alive physically, but he was alive spiritually. And I guess physically, when you consider the fact of who he was. I believe that he was physically alive in the heaven. I believe that he is the one that they call the Lord of hosts. I would believe that he's the one that is called the, Lord, the angel of the Lord, because that angel is always capitalized. And if you notice, whenever that angel comes up in the Old Testament... He blesses and is given worship. That doesn't happen in an ordinary angel. Revelation, there was a man that stood there which was an angel that said to John, as John bowed down to him, don't bow down to me, I'm simply a man just like you are. They can't receive worship. But I believe in the Old Testament, it gives us a little bit of a glimpse into who Jesus is. I believe... But Job knew the power of a redeemer. What was Job's future? Job's future? Notice what he says there in, chat, in verses 27. It says, actually it starts in 26. It says, after my skin is destroyed, this I know. After this body is gone, this I know. That in my flesh I shall see God. Now, folks, he's talking about a translated, glorified body. He said, after this skin is gone on the earth, I know that I'm going to see Jesus, my Redeemer, my Savior, in my glorified body. I wonder if he was hanging on to Abraham when Lazarus was down there and, and uh, the rich man was in the pit of hell. I wonder if Job was right there close listening to what was going on because you see they were in paradise side in Sheol they were in paradise side while the rich man was in Hades and they were viewing that whole incident you see that's not a parable folks that Jesus was talking about there in Luke that was a real story it really took place the rich man was named Dives when you go back to the Septuagint and trace those things out, you'll find it's, that's where it was. He knew. 
he had a redeemer. And he said, if I'm out of this skin, just like what Paul said, for me to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Job knew that. Do you know that? In that other verse in 27, it says, Whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, for my heart yearns within me. He said, the first thing that I'm going to see when I leave this body, I'm going to see my Redeemer. I'm going to see my Redeemer, and I'm going to glorify in Him because I yearn for that. Can you imagine going through those troubles? Don't we really want to yearn to be out of that and to have a different situation than we're in? You see, he was really thinking he was going to die from all this. He was preparing for his death. But it's through God's graciousness that he basically gave him another life here upon the earth because he restored everything that he took away double fold. It's great to live in the blessings of God and to live under the authority of God in your life. As I was preparing for the storm, I told my class this morning that we did several things. I went out and started up an old generator that I had forgotten about. Got it ready. It took a little while. I had to drain the oil out of it and put new gas in it and put a new spark plug in it and make sure it would fire off. Why? Because I'm going to need the energy if the power goes out. But we were blessed. We only had about an hour's worth of time all through that thing. Half hour at the most for the longest period. Praise God for it. Somebody said, well, that's silly. We're going to get back on. Yes, but I've, I praise God for the fact that he protected us. He kept our roof from falling in from all the way to the snow. He kept my carport from falling in as I've seen some others on Facebook that had fallen in. I don't know how many of you all had. I think we figured out we had between 12 and 14 inches there at the house the time it came down. And the last part was kind of a heavy snow. Nobody slipped on the ice except my wife. And it was one that made her really laugh anyway. She was throwing the ball for the dog, and as she threw, she just slipped back there, and down she went. Nobody was seriously hurt. We were able to get out and travel on the roads, even though they were iced over to get to emergency things. God blessed us. And I give him the credit for that. Because he was in charge. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep me against the, uh, that I've committed against that day. I know who my Redeemer is. Do you know who your de Redeemer is? Job's faith was renewed. His confidence was renewed. And he triumphed over his troubles. We can too. If we place our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you don't know him today, I want to give you the opportunity to know him. I want to give you an opportunity to accept him as Lord and Savior. Maybe you've come today just needing to make a reconnection with him. That's what these altars are for. Maybe you've come to look to find a place where you can worship. Folks, we invite you to become part of this church. It's a good church. Look a little sparse right now, but we've got a lot of folks that are watching us right now who couldn't get out. Uh, got a word from uh, Vera and uh, Larry Munster, uh, Munster yesterday. Keep them in prayer. Larry's surgery opened back up on him. He's had to go into a heart hospital uh, at Little Rock. They took him in yesterday morning. But they said to thank the church for the prayers that they have been given for him. Larry was one of the founding members, I believe. He was one of the, one of the uh, founding members of the church. He hasn't been able to come because of his health and his wife's health. Bob and Mary Stewart, if you're all listening, we miss you guys. I know they're listening. I want them to know we love them. Pat and, Jer and Jerry Moore, we know 
while you're not here, but we love you, and we're keeping you in our prayers. Uh, there's so many. Sue Barnes and, and uh, nine, uh, uh, huh? Sue McKnight, keeping her in our prayers. These folks can't come at this point in time. But you know what? COVID's going to be gone one of these days. And we're going to have a celebration. We're going to take the mask off. And we're going to have a big meal. We still got the turkeys over there in the refrigerator. So <laughs> we're going to love the Lord. But if you need the church to come to you, come. We've got a good place here. Whatever your decision this morning, as we stand and sing, won't you come?